Wednesday, March 20th. Welcome into another live stream edition here in the lunchtime hour, at least on the East Coast inside the vault. I'm Bobby Trossett alongside my partner and co-host Sarah Ellison. This episode and this live stream is brought to you by our newest brand sponsor, our friends at Mando. More on them in just a bit, but just a quick little rundown, partner, of what we've got on the docket today, beginning with some comments that Morgan Moses just made within the last hour or so. And Really, the detail just how caught off guard he was by Eric DaCosta's decision and the Ravens' front office's decision to send him back to the New York Jets. He was texting with Derrick Henry, who we thought he was going to be blocking for in 2024. More on that in just a bit, including some other offensive line nuggets. I know you had a chance to uh, catch the national discussion around the Ravens' offensive line, too, as well. Got some fear mongering going on there. Okay. And then a bunch of free agency news within the last 24 hours or so since yesterday's live stream. Arthur Mollett, some news on him. Chris Board, a a reunion in Baltimore. Mike Williams is joining the Jets. And what that might mean for Odell Beckham Jr. Yeah, lots of good stuff. Lots to get to. But we begin with the former Baltimore Raven now who rejoins the New York Jets. This was last week's trade. And Zach Rosenblatt of the Jets reporting wise said that oh well we'll we'll actually just give you what Morgan himself had to say just how caught off guard he was uh by last week's trade back to New York it's truly funny man because I went from texting Derrick Henry Tuesday night to uh finding out Wednesday around noon that I was being traded so um I literally had no idea um what was taking place um at the at the time but uh, I'm truly happy to be back in New York Life comes at you fast in the NFL, huh? Listen, it, it, here's the thing. He's smiling while he says it, so I'm glad Morgan's not, like, sour about it or anything like that because he's a veteran. He's a grizzly uh, veteran. He's been around, and he's just stating facts, right? So, But you got to let EDC cook. You got to let him cook because he had to know because I know we knew that there was a strong chance that he would no longer be a Baltimore Raven. I thought he would just be straight up cut, but the Ravens and EDC took matters into their own hands and got some pretty good, uh, you know, draft compensation out of it. It isn't going to like change the world unless he drafts like the next, I don't know, six round star Uh, or, or with that first or that fourth round pick where he moved up, unless he gets like a star fourth rounder, maybe then it'll change the world. But, uh, Listen, EDC, when he has a move, he's got to go. He's got to go. So, but that is kind of funny, though, where he's like, Derek Henry, welcome to Baltimore. I can't wait to be, you know, blocking yeah. for you. And then he's like, oh, just kidding. JK, I'm out of here. So right? that's kind of crazy. Things happen quickly. EDC working in stealth mode, stealth attack mode, and doing business, right? It's just business, certainly not personal. Yeah. And Morgan played it off well. Like he's, he's ready to be a New York Jet. He's, he's familiar with the organization, and now he's going to have a chance to block for Aaron Rodgers, assuming that A-Rod makes a full recovery from last year's torn Achilles. Speaking of recovery, that's exactly what Morgan's in the middle of doing right now. I can remember talking with you about this, gosh, week after week. What is up with Morgan? He seems like he is laboring out there. He seems like he is really grinding through an upper body injury. Here's what he was really dealing with. I actually tore my pec week four, um, which was was which was pretty fun, and I, I played the whole season with it, and um, you know, just learned how to manage through it and everything like that. And um, I had surgery about five weeks ago, uh, six weeks ago, sorry. Um, but I'm feeling great, you know. I'm, I'm moving around, I'm, I'm working out, getting back in shape, and things like that. And so, um, I look forward to just getting around the guys and obviously doing the things that I need to do to get back on the field um and, and prepare myself the way I need to and um obviously this is not my first time my first rodeo with having surgery and things like that so um you know I I, I like the fact that I I was able to you know you know pretty much go through the whole season with that injury and play at a high level so I look forward to having a, two arms this year so um uh, uh it's, it's been a fun ride wow so yeah, well- Morgan played in 14 games. So he missed a hand, he missed a couple games. But for him to have, like he said, essentially like grinded through this, what a warrior. Yeah, I don't know that we knew that he ripped his pec, but obviously he was on the injury report 
week upon week upon week with a pectoral injury designation there. Um, and you're right. We knew that he was grinding through it, just like we knew Ronnie Stanley was grinding through his uh, knee because the Ravens were unconventionally rotating them every two drives, you know? So here's what's interesting. So remember a couple of, um, I think, days ago? I mean, free agency is like a, a big blur to me now. Yeah. But I had put up some numbers um, of blocking win rate both pass blocking and run blocking and um, all that kind of stuff. And his numbers in some places, both Daniel Falele and McCary outperformed him. I think there was one area where he outperformed them. Now, that being said, that was one armed Morgan Moses, right? <laughs> so if he's since had surgery, then I, there's plenty of reason for the Jets to feel like he can return to form. However, once you start, he's been so durable. And once you start breaking down with that age, you just start breaking down. So I still feel like it was the right move for the Ravens to move forward um, because you do start breaking down. And I just think it's time to like start getting young and fresh uh, there on the offensive line. That being said, much love to him. Really, I thought he, I loved him. I loved him here. Always, always a, a workhorse um, and, and wish him the best outside of when it affects the Ravens. They're not only moving on from Morgan Moses, but as we've detailed, Kevin Zeitler also leaves in free agency. Real the quick Detroit Lions. Yeah, yeah, real quick on that. What's crazy, he signed a one-year deal worth $6 million, Bobby. That's the report. Six. That's the report. Yep. Let me put that in perspective. Remember, that's only $2 million more than the dead money he just incurred yeah. from the Ravens. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that, that dead money the Ravens incurred, he had already been paid that. So it's not like the Ravens could have just said, okay, here's $2 million more and call it a day because yeah. he had already been paid. So he's getting the $6 million on top of the $4 million he'd already been paid by the Ravens. So the Ravens would have had it up the ante by another $6 million. I saw a lot of people saying, well, that's only $2 million more. Why couldn't you bring him back? And that's not exactly how it works. That was a void year on money he'd already been paid. So he already had that in his pocket and went out and got $6 million more. It's not like he's only getting $2 million more. So I just want to make that clear. Yeah, there were a lot of reactions to that, that, and I hadn't even dug into those numbers. So thank you for providing that, because that's not all what it seems to be. Right. Right. With that initial report comes out, and you see the number, and you're like, "Wait, what?" Yeah. So that's some. Con so it would have been good ten million. There. It would for the Ravens. It would have been to get to that six million mark plus the four million. It would have been a. It. I mean, it's a lot. Of, I, I don't know that it exactly would have been ten million on the cap, because who knows what they could have finagled and this and that. And I'm still yeah. getting. I'm still learning about void years because the Ravens hadn't used it too much. But it's not, it wasn't as simple as just, oh, here's another $2 million. Yeah, okay. That's some good context there. So, again, with no Zeitler, with no Moses, and now, obviously, with, with John Simpson leaving for free agency, there are some, there are more questions at the time of this live stream than there are answers. But PFF took a look at the revamped and projected 2024 offensive line in Baltimore, and they have Ronnie Stanley. Mm -hmm. At left tackle, left guard, they have Andrew Voorhees from uh, from USC, of course. He lost all of last year due to his torn ACL. He's somebody that was a seventh-round pick and fell significantly after um, after that, that ACL tear. He was projected, Sarah, to be – I th remember I mentioned yesterday that it may maybe it was mid-round? I'm pretty sure Mel Kuyper just said it would be like second or third round. Yeah, we're going to get so, – I pulled that. We'll get to that for sure. Okay. Yeah. And so anyway, we know Tyler Linderbaum is a, is a staple. He's going to be the starting center. Perhaps Ben Cleveland could be right guard. Any a combination of Daniel Falele or Patrick McCary on the right-hand side. Anyway, we bring this up because not everybody is convinced that the Ravens <laughs> have done enough given the, given the Derrick Henry acquisition. Yeah, no, they're definitely not everybody's convinced. And I know people have tweeted me being like, should I be worried by now? How should I be feeling? Uh, all that kind of stuff. My, my typical answer is, you know, the games are played in September. Uh, but here's what um, Andrew Dawkins had to say on NFL Live. This is them reacting once Zeitler went over to, uh, was officially made a Detroit Lion. You've lost 60% of your offensive line. The piece that you did retain in Ronnie Stanley was, he struggled mightily last year. Mm -hmm. A lot of that large part 
due to injury. So, yes, Derrick Henry is an addition in the backfield. But as we know, there were so many elements of this offense that made the Ravens special. But offensive success is dictated in the trenches, period. And I can promise you, what they didn't pitch to Derrick Henry was him coming in and not having a good offensive line. That's absolutely not the case. So, Actually, without those offensive linemen that they lost, and Zeitler to the Lions makes more sense personality-wise than maybe any signing I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> but without that offensive line, I can promise you there's a higher chance of the, the signing of Derrick Henry not paying dividends unless mm -hmm. they address the O-line in the draft. Yeah. All right, so just a couple of things on that. Like, uh, you know, where we stand today and how things are going, we don't know. This was a little bit of fear-mongering where he's saying, I guarantee that in pitch – to Derrick Henry, that they would not have a good offensive line. Listen, I don't expect the national media to um, know the depth of every of all 32 teams, right? They know more the starters, the stars, all that kind of stuff. So um, I know for a fact that the Ravens will augment this offensive line through the draft. Like it's it's we all know that for a fact. It's going to happen. But as I said yesterday, um because the Ravens aren't even making noise on the veteran market and they don't like to be desperate when they go into the draft. Um, I'm not ruling out, you know, a, a, a inexpensive veteran being added, but this lineup that you see right here, I don't expect them to think of, Oh, Ben Cleveland's the next man up. He's heading into his fourth year and he's started here and there for the last couple years at right, right guard and left guard. And he's performed pretty well, and he and he keeps getting better. I don't expect them to remember that Voorhees is there. You know, Mel Kuyper remembered, uh, but I don't expect them to remember that. So uh, now I don't think that all, this is exactly what the offensive line is going to be come September. But I think knowing that this is the projected one in March, and knowing you're going to add to it, uh, I just think that the national media are underestimating what the Ravens do year in and year out. And this graphic completely shows what the Ravens do every year. So Jason over at over the cap put together this graph where he puts in the logo of all 32 teams and the horizontal axis uh, talks about, you know, the free agency dollars that have left that has left your team. And then the uh, vertical axis is the ones that you've added. So if you're in the bottom right, which is where the Ravens are, it means that you're losing players and not replacing them through free agency. The Ravens are near the bottom. Only the Texans are <laughs> below them. The Texans have done very little. But this is how when the Ravens say that they build their team through the draft, this is what it looks like. They mean it. And they mean it. And so let Eric DaCosta have the several months that there are to continue to replace things. And I understand there's angst. Everybody can have angst in the meantime. That's fine. I just choose not to because I've seen this show about a, you know, how many years have been doing this? This is probably the 20th year that I've seen this show. Yeah. Yeah. More on Andrew Voorhees and who the Ravens have in him yeah. in just a second here. But before we get there, as you heard at the top, this episode is brought to you by our newest brand sponsor, our friends at Mando. And they want to know, are you struggling with body odor? Maybe your daily life consists of some kind of physical fitness or maybe that three-in-one shampoo that you've been using leaves you feeling like you need a second shower just hours after you take your first. From the founders of Lumi, Mando Whole Body Deodorant is helping men conquer their odor in a new way. It's formulated with mandelic acid. Uh, it's got a long-lasting 72-hour odor control that actually stops odor before it starts. And the best part is you can put Mando everywhere. Your pits, packages, feet, skin folds, back, your knees, everywhere. Mando's cologne quality scents were created with men in mind. So consider trying out their best-selling scent and a personal favorite of mine, the bourbon leather. And you won't certainly won't regret it. Once you experience fresher underarms, a fresher package, and fresher feet, you'll never go back. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code VAULT. At shopmando.com. That's shopmando.com. New customers, again, get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code VAULT at shopmando.com. All that information can be found in the show notes below. Real quick on this, Bobby. When I got yeah. my Mando yeah. uh, package, of course, I was going to give it to my husband. I didn't want to smell like a man. 
Uh, but my 15 year old or soon to be 15 year old son comes in and swipes it right away. The best part of this for me. Okay. And I hate to throw my sons under the bus, but I think this is normal for teenage boys that are going from never smelling. Cause you're, yeah. you're small and like, you just don't work up a sweat. I'm telling you the feet situation around here was a problem. So the Mando feet lotion has changed our lives. Thank you, Mando, because boy, oh boy, were my <laughs> boys and their feet. And I'm telling you, I was washing socks. We were doing everything and it wasn't yeah. helping. And like the feet lotion, like, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am dead. The hormones are running rampant over there. <laughs> You've got kids that are coming up. Yeah. They're coming up. Oh, man, that's great. Well, yeah, I'm glad. See, you know what? Something about these brand sponsors, like, your kids should just come on and do the ad because they steal these things stuff. from you. I know. you know, sunglasses, sleep masks, Mando. We could go on and on. That's hysterical. Special thanks to Mando for supporting our channel and uh, continuing to believe in what we're building here in Baltimore. Andrew Voorhees hopes that he's building in year two after losing all of year one to the aftermath of that torn ACL that he sustained during his pro day. He is a USC offensive lineman. Uh, specialty is guard. And Mel Kuyper Jr., just a short while ago, and Ryan Mink transcribed this, says that the Ravens having an uh, – Andrew Voorhees being around mm -hmm. is like the Ravens having an extra second or third round pick this year in 2024. And he was quoted for saying that he's a guy that I think is a plug-and-play starter at guard this year. So remember, as we talked about in recent episodes, the Ravens had their press conference last year after we all thought they were done after six rounds. The press conference finished up. The seventh round was still ongoing. They decided to go back in, trade up, and go get a seventh rounder, and they used that on Andrew Voorhees. So that's something we all got to keep in mind when you're looking at these projected lineups you're looking at the depth that they have. You're maybe not feeling like they have enough now that they went out and got Derrick Henry. Well, maybe you shouldn't feel as 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 if there's that much of a void because of what they have in Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. And and Ryan followed up with that that transcribed tweet from Mel Kuyper, and he recently did a uh, feature story on Voorhees. And uh, he told Ryan that he's physically ready to play after the knee injury. He said, quote, I'm stronger than ever. I'm just scratching the days off the calendar, getting ready for OTAs. Let's so go. he sounds like he's going to be ready day one for OTAs. And by the way, I don't, uh, I, 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 I hate, I, I don't like to kick people once they're gone or anything. I hope I'm not doing this year. Uh, really happy for John Simpson and that he was able to resurrect his career here in, in Baltimore. He, he said when he got here that he had lost his confidence with the Raiders and then he was able to like pl play all 17 games, start all 17 games. And it, it, he was great to have there. And he was able to turn that into a nice deal for himself, a two-year deal. That being said, replacing John Simpson level play is not the hardest thing in the world to do. Oh. Right? And so like whether it's Voorhees or somebody else, that's that's the minimum standard. And I think what the Ravens are saying by letting these two guys go is for sure on, on the Simpson side, we can do that and more. Okay. So when you hear these national guys, like again, and I'm not hating on Andrew Hawkins, he doesn't know what's in the pipeline. I don't think. Um, but when you hear that, it's just like uh, Voorhees could very well be better than Simpson. Now Zeitler, I don't want to downplay. He's been legitimately fantastic. Uh, Hasn't quite made the Pro Bowl, but finally did as an alternate and has been deserving of it. So I don't want to, and he stabilized that position for a long time or after it wasn't stabilized for a long time after Marshall Yonda left. Yep. That said, we have seen what Cleveland can do and the numbers are pretty good, you know? So, uh, so the cupboard is not bare and they're only going to add more to come. Absolutely. Let's get to some free agency signings that took place on Tuesday. This was actually some late news that came in on Tuesday night, yep. uh, or I guess more towards uh, you know after dinner time. Cameron Wolf tweeted, Jeff Zarevic was all over this as well, that um, free agent slot cornerback Arthur Mollett is re-signing a two-year deal. It's a multi-year deal 
with the Ravens. And as Cameron went on to write, it was a great late training camp signing for EDC last summer. And after a career year balling out at the age of 30, much like some other players did in Baltimore, Javian Clowney comes to mind, Kyle Van Noy comes to mind. Uh, he is back in Baltimore on a new deal. One of the unsung heroes from a year ago who really, really provided some depth and was reliable for them. And it's just a tough nose player for them defensively. Yeah, I, I like this signing. I, when free agency first started, I felt like there would only be a chance to get one of um, either Arthur Millette or Ronald Darby. I personally had wanted more Ronald Darby just because he could play on the outside. Um, that being said, once Darby was gone, it's like, can we get Millette then? And he was, he was, he was great. He was, he played really well. He's more of a slot guy. Um, so he's, he's 30 years old. Uh, but he had, so last year he had the second most snaps in the slot cornerback position. So behind Kyle Hamilton. That's wild. Yeah. So 388 there. Um, now this is what, what I'm kind of thinking of is you're completely covered at the slot now. I mean, you've got Hamilton who can play there. You've got um, Humphrey who can play there. Obviously, Mallet is w one of the reasons why you bring him back. But then Ardarius Washington, who they also re-signed, he had made more of a transition over to the slot. So you're – and plus you got Pepe Williams if he gets healthy, right? And so this makes me wonder – if our Darius Washington had made a pretty seemed like a pretty complete move over to slot corner, but he was a safety. So this makes me wonder if they perhaps move him back to safety uh, as a depth piece there. And then maybe you're also using Kyle Hamilton more back in that, that more safety role than playing at slot corner. But the, the point is, and this has always been true, whether it's Mike McDonald or now Zachary or, or some, or one of the defensive coordinators before they like to play positionless football. And so you kind of want to see all these guys be able to move around. So now at this point though, you don't really need, it seems like right now Hamilton would, or not Hamilton, um, Humphrey would play out, out on the outside, but they obviously definitely need more depth on the outside. Well, speaking of that, from a depth perspective, you know, some of these names that you're mentioning, I really hope like a Pepe or a JAD, Jalen Armour Davis, right? Or, or an Ardarius Washington. One of those three kind of has a breakout year out of nowhere for this team because it's really going to help out in the depth department. Like, you know, this is a great signing, but if one of those three dudes kind of like, and they've been around for a couple of years now, like if they can take a step forward and provide them some stability uh, in that cornerback room, They'll be better for it. But I just don't know, you know, of the three. And like you said, our Darius can be, can be moved around. But do you have the confidence that J.A.D. or Pepe can be that guy? I don't. No. They, well, they haven't stayed healthy enough to even yeah. know. So, no, you, you, definitely, you definitely need depth out there. Elsewhere, a reunion. It is definitely a reunion. Veteran special teams ace Chris Board is signing with the Ravens. Tom Pelissero was all over this. We know that uh, Board got his start with Baltimore as an undrafted free agent in 2018. They groomed him. They sent him off. And now they're bringing him back in. So good, solid shot in the arm for a special teams group that, uh, for John Harbaugh standards, a year ago, probably below average. So Subpar. this is, yeah, this is a replacement for Delshawn Phillips, who uh, signed elsewhere. I can't remember off the top of my head where he went. So they needed more special teams. So he will big time, as as Tom Pelissero is pointing out here, big time help on special teams. I, you know, depth at inside linebacker, sure. But it is kind of cool to see a 2018 undrafted rookie, played here for a while, went elsewhere, and he's still doing well. It's just like one of those, Phillips went to the Texans. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so it's just like a nice story to see that, you know, this undrafted rookie has had made himself a career. And a lot of times it's like, if you can't make it on defense or offense, see what you can do on special teams and make a career out of it. And there's been a lot of guys who've come through Baltimore. That's done that for sure. Elsewhere, Jadavian Clowney, we all know he had a career year tying that all time high of his personally with nine and a half sacks last year. He's going to visit the New York Jets. We knew this was on on the docket. It's just a reminder been, that it's happening now, probably. He's probably there chatting with him now. Yep. 
And they've been busy. <laughs> they've been busy. We'll get to more on what the Jets have been up to this week later on in the show. But uh, Jadavian spent some time with Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, last week. Yeah. So it's the New York Jets this week. Hopefully Baltimore still in the conversation. Jeff Zarebek, as he always does, goes back and forth with folks on X. And he said that uh, generally, I'm not discounting the chance that they make a significant sign. And they'd like to bring Clowney back, uh, a few other guys. But the free agent market is pretty thin at the moment. Don't think they feel an urgency to immediately fill holes when similar options figure to be available later on, which is very similar to how they handled their business last off season at that position. Yeah. So this is just a question of, you know, somebody had asked him, do you think there's still going to be signings? And he's just saying they're not in any, in any hurry, but he did single out that they want clowning or they, they'd like to. So, um, I'm just hoping, <laughs> I'm just hoping that, you know, if, if the jets were to give him an offer today, that his agent would call the Ravens and be like, can you match this or do better? You know, right. because he did have such right. a good time here. So hopefully they have a good relationship <laughs> with, with that agent and whatnot. And who knows if Clowney will be in any hurry to make a decision, even though he's making the visits now, who knows if he's in any hurry in any hurry to make a decision, but I I'd like to hope that he's going to keep EDC in the conversation to give him a, an opportunity to at least match or, or one up any offer he gets. Well, John Harbaugh definitely has a good relationship with his agent uh, at the combine. Oh, that's right. that, that video, that's right. <laughs> he ran into Jadavian's agent on the street uh, you know, around Indianapolis, where everybody was that time of year for the combine in the NFL. And he said that his agent told John that it was the first time he's ever finished a season happy. Yeah, <laughs> like this dude's been around for like a decade. For a while, he's been on a lot, a lot, a lot of teams. So come on back, JD. Man, or JC. Like, Shoot. Yeah. Ten, I mean, how, yeah, he's been around for, I think it was like 20, wasn't it 2014? He was the number one overall pick. Like the guy's been around for like a decade. Yeah. For a while now. Yeah, you were right. And, and to just, to just feel happy after this, the end of a season, like, man, hopefully that means something to him. What means something to Aaron Rodgers and the Jets is that they're going to have a new weapon. And that's Mike Williams off, away from the Chargers now. So uh, lots of, lots of changes for Jim Harbaugh in LA. But the Jets are bringing in Mike Williams. Ian Rappaport was all over this. It's a one-year deal worth up to $15 million. Probably takes Odell, OBJ, out of the equation here for New York. Maybe he ends up in – oh, God, is he going to end up in Kansas City? Oh, <laughs> Where's God. OBJ going to end up? Why would you even put that into the air? Houston? Could he go to Houston? Houston? I could see him in, in the, with the Texans. Maybe, maybe – well, well, maybe – could L.A. use him? And they just lost Mike. I mean, does he want to go into a Roman offense? Yeah, might as well come back to Baltimore, bro. Oh, man. Well, he already he said sayonara to Baltimore earlier this week. Well, we things can always change, Bobby. The market is fluid. The market is fluid. <laughs> Obviously not at the same price. That feels like a lot, too, but who knows? I mean, worth up to. You never know what that actually means. Yeah. Um, but that's a decent amount of money for a guy that has been playing like half the games every year. Hasn't been the most healthy. And by the way, yeah. speaking of Odell, he's still... Uh, on Twitter fighting against narratives as I'm sure he's going to need to as he's trying to, you know, get a nice deal. But um, somebody on Twitter had said the weakest agenda of all time is, quote, one catch made OBJ, of course, of course, referring to the one in the Super Bowl, which really was phenomenal. But then he pointed out that OBJ had in his first three years over 4,000 yards and 35 touchdowns. He was a rookie yeah. of the year and pointed out of his all of his stats there. And first five of six seasons, he goes, he's got 1K plus each season. And so... And and then was on his way to being an MVP in the Super Bowl. And so he says, respect OBJ. And OBJ quote retweets that and says, period. <laughs> but that's the world we live in. Create the agenda. Get followers to follow that and have people just say the same thing that they say on the internet. One thing I learned is life is all about situations. And not every situation is for everybody. Since then, I've been doing what I could do what I could to the best of the situation I was in. So chilling. I know I'm straight in real life. I, I agree with OBJ here. I just feel like when guys start to trail off or obviously he's been dealing with injuries and he hasn't been putting up these insane numbers, you like remake the narrative, like just put that he's been injured the last couple of years, managed to almost become a Super Bowl MVP within it. And didn't quite put up the production numbers he wanted to in Baltimore, 
but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden it was one catch that made him like he he was legitimately a star and put up a lot of production i just don't know why you have to discount what he previously did to point out that you know he's on the decline now he's cracking me up on instagram this offseason he his son he had his son doing pilates last night on his instagram story <laughs> his son is cute as a button and they those two are like inseparable love it yeah it's yeah. it's it's cool to see and again i'm you know i'm on record for being wrong about but about obj and i've actually really started since i've been following him like closely on instagram and he's just been very I, i'd say like he kind of lets you into his life once the off season hits and it's just cool to see him as yeah. a father and the way those two have a relationship together but anyway continue on here and we'll see by the way look out for the jets I know you say it every year, and, and I know you have, have. We all have our. You kind of want to have um, some skepticism about whether or not they can put it all together. But if Aaron can stay healthy outside of his first four snaps of the season, <laughs> they've done a lot. They have done. They've done a lot. But they do a lot. a lot every March, Bobby. So I'm definitely going to remain in my skepticism. Uh, hey, they've drafted decently well in recent years, too. Well, they do have Joe Douglas coming from Baltimore, yeah. so he has been better. But it's still like, I mean, I, I'm still skeptical. Skeptical. Like, and it wasn't, and I was a skeptical of the Browns every year until they finally did something this last year. And so we'll see if they can do that again. I kind of feel like I've said before, they kind of just like ran into Joe Flacco um, and, and he helped things. But, I mean, they have a phenomenal defense, but. Um, until I see it in the regular season, I'm just not going to get nervous about winning in March. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. But I think, man, on, on paper, what you get on paper, paper, on paper, ooh, on paper, they're looking dangerous and Hey, hope the best for Chuck Clark that he can make a full recovery for them yeah. and be safety. Because remember he lost all of last year with that training camp injury. So, uh, crossing my fingers that, that Chuck's able to kind of get back into the fold up there because that's a bad defense. And I mean, like a bad boy defense. They, that's a dominant. That can be a dominant defense. They literally tried to keep them in games. If if their offense wasn't inept a year ago, they probably would have had many more wins because of the way that defense was playing. So, go back to the AFC North. The Browns and James Prochet, former Ravens wide receiver, have agreed to terms. It's a one year deal to bring him back. Good for he James. was the primary. Punt. Yeah, yeah. He's been he's been through a lot. He was the primary punt returner in the back half of last season. So he's going to get another shot here. Was definitely up and down uh, in some primetime games that I, I can remember watching a year ago. But James is going to have a chance to rejoin the Cleveland Browns. And speaking well, meanwhile, of those Browns, here, though, yeah, I want to point this. So we already knew that they had traded for, um, for uh, Jerry Judy. But the money came in yesterday. Which is bananas to me that the Browns did this. I don't know why I'm sh shocked by the Browns. So they agreed to a three-year contract extension with them, worth up to fifty-eight million. So we're in the we're including forty-one million guaranteed. They love to give out guaranteed money, don't they, Bobby? Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially not, the dudes who haven't preferred. He's done nothing in the NFL. Well, that's like the point. So fifty-eight million is. <laughs> for three years is almost 20 million per year. Like leave it to the Browns. This is supposed to be a prove it year for him. And you know what? Maybe he'll end up proving it. Maybe he will. But instead of like paying him after he proved it, like they did the biggest Browns thing and yeah. just said, no, we'll give you the money up front. Right. Right. And much like, for, and much like for very different reasons than, than Deshaun. He was a headache. He's always been as a headache, and he's underperformed in Denver to begin his NFL career. The guy's done nothing. He he has a, a very high ceiling. Just ask Lamar. They're South Florida buddies. Like, this dude can play, but he hasn't yet done so in the NFL. And so he for Cleveland to award him that, to your point, is just yet another business decision by that organization that makes you think, who is running it? We just who talked yesterday. We just talked yesterday how the Chiefs, Got Hollywood Brown, one year. So this is a true prove it deal. One year, eleven million. This guy's getting twenty million a year for the next three years. Got forty one million guaranteed. <laughs> what? If I'm Rashad Bateman, I'm like, hey, you know, I, I might want to go to Cleveland here yeah. in the <laughs> yeah. next couple of years. <laughs> like, like, let me see if I can stay in division and follow Gino, follow these other guys that have decided PQ decided to stay in division. If they're going to be making those types of decisions. 
And Andrew Barry is their GM. This dude's like a wizard. He's from, I'm pretty sure he grew up in like Bel Air, Maryland, outside of, uh, outside of Baltimore. And, and it's just since he has taken over, and I know a lot of this is ownership too, especially with the quarterback decision. What are you guys doing? They're just doling it out. Keep doing Growing it. on trees. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, from a Ravens perspective, keep doing it. Keep doing it. What about Chase Young? He's also a DMV guy. Yeah, well, so we knew, we knew yesterday that um, he had signed with the Saints, but I thought this extra detail um, is interesting of why his market wasn't very high because he got a one-year $13 million deal. <laughs> Again, just remember... Kyle Van Noy was like a one year, $3 million deal. I mean, one year, 13 million. <laughs> okay. I just Maybe can't get over how emotion. Eric DaCosta cooked last year at the pass rusher position. Anyway, people, I had, we had mentioned yesterday that it might've been the medical that didn't make his um, market as hot. And that is indeed here. What Adam Schefter is reporting. He said that uh, Chase Young will be undergoing a neck procedure mm. that is expected to sign him until training camp. So he'll be back for training camp if it all goes as expected. Um, so he said that uh, teams were aware of the neck issue and the saints were the ones that were comfortable moving ahead with it. 13 million. Oh. He's about to have neck surgery. So, but wish him well, hopefully the surgery goes well. You don't want any player. I mean, uh, man, I just hate to see their bodies break down. So wish him yeah. the best, yeah. but I think it explains a little bit of why his market wasn't very hot. Right. A little bit of insight there in terms of, yeah. uh, Maybe I don't know. Maybe the, maybe Baltimore is one of those teams that didn't feel good about the medical. Yeah, yeah. So so there you have it. And, he, and they're very familiar with him, being that he grew up in the in the D.C. area. Anyway, Brad Stainbrook reporting. He's he's been on a couple things this this offseason. Yeah, season. he's he's been getting some news. Brad, by the way, we we dragged Brad for something in season, deservingly so. What was it? It was um, oh, it was when Roquan had to say some stuff about Cleveland. Remember the dog pound comments? Oh, uh, is that him? And, and Brad like tried to put words in his mouth. Oh yeah. Oh, Pretty about sure coming to your house and in front of your children and yeah. wife and yeah, beating you and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I want to say that was Brad, but anyway, we'll, we'll get some. Brad I don't know. I don't know, but he's today. been getting the news recently, so there's that. Brad is on top of um, of the Tennessee Titans, who, according to his report, have emerged uh, as serious contenders uh, with serious interest in signing cornerback from uh, Kansas City, Legereus Sneed. Talks will continue, but Tennessee is very interested. Remember, Sneed had really the play of the game in the AFC Championship game. Well, that's my that was what I was going to get to. So first of all, Brad followed up, by the way, earlier today and said that they've been in chat, they've been in talks for, in the last 24 hours. Count me as somebody that hopes that he leaves the Kansas City Chiefs yeah, <laughs> and yeah. goes elsewhere. And this brings us kind of into our quick hits, which is what I think you were leading to, which yeah. is there's over the last 24 hours been this debate about like the worst memory playoff memory in Ravens history. And so the two major candidates are the 2011 loss to the playoffs. And you can take your pick out of that game, whether you were more hurt by Cundiff missing uh, the field goal or Lee Evans having the touchdown catch that would have sent them to the Super Bowl. Like yeah. it would have been done. Yeah. They would have been in the Super Bowl and then just, I, I call it a drop. Some people say that it was like later came in and you can see the Patriots hand kind of knocking it out. I don't care. You secure the ball. Okay. So there's that. Yeah. Or the more recent memory of a tragedy was Sneed, who we just talked about. Get him out of yeah. here. Take him yeah. out of Kansas city, please. Yeah. Uh, and he'd still be in the AFC, but I don't care. It's the Kansas city chiefs who the Ravens have to get over. <laughs> Uh, but he knocked it out of Flowers' hand. Now, that would have just made it a one-possession game if if Zay Flowers had scored there. So, Bobby, I will ask you, which do you think hurts more? Well, this is hard for me because, I, I mean, I wasn't – I'm one of the new, like, new-age Ravens creators, right? Like, I wasn't even in Baltimore when Cundiff missed. So, like, I don't really know if I can speak to this, but it seems like the Zay one is for – the the Gen Z people, and then the OGs are the are the two former. So I'm gonna have to lean on you in terms of what okay. what hurt more in the grand scheme of things. So I'll put it this way, um, because I have seen the Gen Z getting a lot of crap from from OG Ravens fans. 
Uh, go go and do your do your due diligence. You just joined the Ravens and like with Lamar or something like that, right? Like you you don't know anything, right? So um, I'm not Gen Z by the way. I'm millennial. You are Gen Z. I, what are you? You're that's millennial? crazy. Gen Z is like when does that begin? Well, I'm if not- you were in your, I think it's like if you're in your 20s when when like when it when 2000 came. Hold on a second. You a live Google up. search. I've looked it up a few this. times. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. While you're looking it up, let me just tell you where I am. As a person that was born with <laughs> one day left in 1979, <laughs> I am literally right between Gen X and millennials. And okay. so um, so some of us, because we're so in between them and we don't quite fully identify with either one, some people call us the Oregon Trail generation that's what? kind of stuck in between. Because when we are in, you don't remember, do you not know what Oregon Trail is? Yeah, but I just didn't know that that was like. Oh, when I went to my technology class in elementary school and back then you're like on the old school, like IBM or like the very first generation of Mac computers. We loved Oregon Trail. Okay, we were trying to kill Buffalo so we could survive. We've got question marks from Jeremiah. (laughs) I'm dead. I'm loving I'm loving this tangent. Young people not know about Oregon Trail. This is all Zay's fault. This is all Zay's fault. (laughs) So anyway. Anyway, I pro- I kind of more identify with Generation X more than than Millennial, but again, we okay. like we were the ones that really didn't have any like I didn't have internet till I was really in college. Well, I didn't start using the internet to like do papers until I was in college. That really okay. wasn't you know a thing. So anyway, point being, I was covering the Ravens during that 2011 one. And I think the OG Ravens are being a little bit hard on the Gen Z Ravens, okay. and here here's why. It definitely hurt in the moment, and we were ticked off at Evans and Cundiff, okay? But that pain didn't linger for super long. And so while I agree, and even if if if, if Zay had caught that and secured it, it still is a one-possession game, so I don't know that you can say it hurts as much. But, but here's the thing. 1997 is millennials. Okay, I got to stop reading comments. Um Pats uh, has the best. Pats is the best, though. That's why I put it up. What do on you the say? Screen. Oregon Trail. Speak off season content. <laughs> Whatever. We're in the quick kick section too, but it is off season. But by the um, way, after you finish this thought, I yeah. have each category. Okay. Okay. So okay. I'm ready to. So go. so anyway, um, here's why I would. Here's why I think that Zay's play isn't getting enough. Um, I don't know attention from the OG fans like myself because as soon as that happened Ozzie Newsom was like see ya Evans cuts him never hear from again wow. see ya Cundiff cuts him never hear from again the problem with the last game was more like you're mad at the coaching staff who's still around and right. so it's like and coming off of 2019 so this one lingers more do you know what I mean like the pain from this one lingers more than it did with Lee and Cundiff um, because they got cut right away and you still essentially had the same team and you were like, it was like a true revenge tour. Ravens never got the revenge tour from t- 2019. Yeah. And then yeah. you put two, 2023 right on top of it. So yeah. it hurts. I feel like it, the pain is lingering more than that one with Cundiff and Lee Evans did. But so I say that I think the OG Ravens need to give the Zay one a little bit more love. That said, I'm still picking the 2011 one because the Super Bowl was in hand and Zay Flowers one wasn't. That seems fair to me. Zay's was like a per Zay was a part of a perfect storm. Right? Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. The other two seem like they were a little bit more isolated. And so it's it's harped on a little bit more as the singular reason. Right. Versus right. Versus like right. Zay, you could have put Zay in a bucket. With a couple of other things, right. including the strategizing. It, it was like Ronnie Stanley letting the sec- like a, somebody get the blind yeah. side of Lamar, or it's Lamar into the th- three person coverage, or it's yeah. the refs not calling a holding on likely, or it's John Harbaugh and and Todd Munkin forgetting yeah, the identity, exactly. like all of it. Exactly. Yeah. That's that's the entire bucket. Yeah. So Gen Z is ninety seven to twenty twelve babies. Millennials is eighty one to ninety six, which puts me right there I'm as a twenty nine year old. Right. And Gen X is 65 to 80 and so on and so forth. So, okay. well, that's why so, yep. I am. I am right there on the cusp because I was like one, I was one day into, into, yes. 
Okay. So technically I'm Gen Z, but I'm like on the last day of it. You can represent both, whatever you <laughs> see fit, right? <laughs> but yes, I am a, uh, so, so anybody calling me a Gen Zer, right? I got a couple of years. So you're cushion. solidly in millennial, right? I am. So, I'm a 94 you're baby and millennials okay. is, is 81 to 96. The 30th is coming up. <laughs> I, I have, uh, yeah, I have uh, Horus Taurus or whatever this this channel is. You got you got to you got to give us something better. I have Horus Taurus to come up with something that it's like a easy name for us to describe when because you're always dropping in great comments. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, I'm not thirty yet. In July, just put a deposit down on a beach house. We're doing Tropalooza six point oh. Wait, 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 in Ocean wait, City, wait. Maryland. Wait, 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 wait. You're gonna have your own beach house? Yeah, we're doing a sixteen person beach house in ocean city maryland bro july 27th weekend i am renting that from you and i expect a discount <laughs> hey maybe we just like combine <laughs> i'll bring my family you bring your family oh that's hilarious oh yeah. my gosh i know you told me this but it just clicked that i like i for real i'm gonna like talk to you about this offline <laughs> oh yeah yeah it'd be fun it'd be fun we got a dock the boat slip comes with the dock what uh well, we gotta get the boat, but the, just having the slip is big when you're in Ocean City. So we just gotta figure out where we're doing a boat sponsorship through. So if anybody is in the, <laughs> the Ocean I'm City, to Maryland Maryland area, we're, I'm gonna tell him tonight when he gets home. Here we go. Oh, I'm fired up too because now the only thing we gotta talk about when it when it draws closer is that that's typically opening weekend of training camp, like it was last year when I had my other. <laughs> When I had my other party and you were in town and I was hosting a party and, and uh, you brought your son and there were so many variables in play. Jeremiah telling us to have this conversation on our own time. We will not, Jeremiah. This is quick hits time and we're we're going down a rabbit hole and we're doing it. <laughs> love it. Love it. Cannot wait. Cannot wait. And uh, cannot wait to continue to listen to these two studs Yeah. because uh, the Ravens announced Plus an Washburn. extension. I got to get a picture of him. What's that? Plus Washburn is the side oh, yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, Evan. And we got to have Evan back on, honestly, because... We hadn't ha we haven't had him uh, Evan Washburn, who is the sideline reporter for the Ravens during tr uh, preseason play, and then a national sideline reporter, having done many Super Bowls for CBS. We got to have him back on the show. But anyway, we've had all three on: Jerry Sandusky, voice of the Ravens; Rod Woodson, Hall of Famer and and current analyst. We had him on during our time in Vegas for the mm -hmm. Super Bowl. But anyway, awesome. the Ravens announced an extension with my former employer, WBAL. Uh, TV, radio, and 98 Rock as their official broadcast partners through the 2030 season. So the partnership all of a sudden dates all the way back to 2006, and that's going to continue uh, for the next six plus years. I like it. I'm sorry. I'm not over the, the beach house yet. I think you need a few <laughs> vault fans at that OC party. <laughs> knowing me. You know what we should me. do? Because you said it's the first week of training camp. Let's just go. Let's just go and cover it from from your beach house. Hey, boom! I mean, I, should I just open these this door up? I mean, <laughs> the place is massive. Like it's got an elevator in it. <laughs> oh my god! I love oh, this. Oh man, okay, I put sorry. I put far too much down uh, on this deposit. By the oh, way, so god. the boys better come through. All right, or whoever ends up coming to this party better come through because Ooh. I need some help. All right, last quick hit here. I just put this in here as like an overall kind of conversation to have, but the Ravens Nation Live uh, Twitter account, fan, fan account, said Sports Illustrated should suggest that the Ravens draft Tennessee quarterback Joe Milton with a mid-round pick to replace Tyler Huntley. Whether it's Joe Milton or not, Bobby, like because Lamar was healthy all 17 games last year, yeah. it kind of like covers the pain we had from the previous two years. And how when Huntley went in, I love him, but it just, yeah. everything just, just self-destructed. Like, look, like Josh Johnson is a journeyman. Ravens re-signed him. Still not feeling great if Lamar were to like miss like what, six games or something, right? I don't know much about Malik Cunningham. I know that the Ravens took him off the Patriots practice squad. Maybe he's something, but... I'm not against the Ravens drafting a backup quarterback. I want that to be solid. You don't have a lot of money to spend there. So I wouldn't mind. We keep talking about the draft and we haven't once talked about perhaps drafting a backup quarterback. And I would like an upgrade there. 
I'm yeah. mad that the now the more I think about it, I'm like, why didn't the Ravens give a six rounder for Justin Fields? Well, oh my, that would have been insane mm. if Justin Fields is in Baltimore as the primary backup to Lamar. That would be that would that'd be, be wild. It'd be great. I don't know. I think the Ravens have what they need, to be honest with you, in this category. I think they like Malik. So if Lamar misses six games. You feel like we could be five hundred? I feel like what I saw from Malik's teammates in New England when he left made me intrigued. They felt like he was not given a fair shot with the Patriots or even given a remote chance. So that kind of excites me. He and Lamar have a relationship. There's similar backgrounds there. Got the Louisville ties. Like I kind of like, I kind of like the thought of it. 500 football. I can't confidently say. So I'm with you there. Mm. You might be more confident to bring in somebody like a Joe Milton that can give you that contingency plan confidence. But um, I don't know. I'll be surprised if they use. All right. Well, I want to like see. I, I want to see Malik. I want to see him. We'll get, I'm sure we'll get a chance to see him quite a bit in OTAs and training camp and all of that. But uh, listen, anytime you lose Lamar, it's you're you're gonna get. I mean. Any backup is going to be nowhere near as good, but it would be nice if you could win something just under 500. No just doubt. If, if he were like to go down with like a, say like in week, you know, seven, it's like a six game, it's a six game hiatus and he comes back. Who can keep you afloat for six weeks? And so um, is, is, do they have the guys to do that? I'm not so sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I, I hope it's Malik, man. I, I think he's – I want to dig into him a little bit more, some of his Patriots tape, see what they actually have in him. But yep. I want to shout out to a couple of our OG patrons who are supporting the channel and everything we're building here in Baltimore through Patreon this month. So we appreciate Michael Rossi and Chef Trez. Thank you both. We appreciate you guys. If you're interested in doing the same out there and you want to throw a few bucks our way in exchange for a monthly shout-out, or any other membership tier that we have available, go check out patreon.com forward slash Ravens Vault Podcast to learn more about what we're offering here inside the channel this month. So special thanks to our friends at Mando, our brand new channel sponsor. You can learn more about them in the show notes. And again, tickets are available. We are coming up on a, a, our one-month countdown to our first ever. And yeah, Justin's always making sure that the like button's being smashed. Appreciate the love, Justin. I had a chance to meet Justin actually at the uh, one of the Be More Around Town tailgates, which nice. which Be More Around Town's having a tailgate for opening day. It's Orioles opening day next week, so can't wait to get back out there with Brian and the group. Let me know if you guys are heading out there. But um, our first ever in person NFL draft live stream party coming up April twenty fifth. Forty bucks gets you in the door. Tickets are available and they're going and they're going quickly. Uh, in the link that we have included in the show notes for you, so. I know you and I are super fired up about this. You're flying in so much, so much so you're fired up that you decided to fly in from Columbus. So cannot wait. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Hope everybody, you know, grabs some tickets and meets us there and uh, just takes in this draft, all of us together. Soundstage. Soundstage, Soundstage 124 Marketplace, Baltimore. downtown Baltimore, right across the street from Power Plant. Clean Cuisine is going to have uh, – a big time catering that I cannot wait to have some of you try. For those of you who've, who've watched my videos over the last like eight months since they've been sponsoring my channel, I've been eating really, really clean. And uh, you're going to have a chance to try it for the first time too. So good. That'll be good. And then, of I'm course, you, you know, we'll have an in person live stream going all night long. We'll have video boards up so you can watch as the picks go. Uh, and, and we work our way up to the 30th overall uh, when Baltimore will be probably in the 11 o'clock hour uh, based on how the the time has gone in the past. So anyway, all that and more is, is what we have to look forward to. Thanks for joining us for this lunch hour live stream, something that we're going to continue to experiment with this off season. Like the video, if you haven't already done so subscribe to the vault on YouTube and check us out in the audio only space. If you haven't done that already as well. So for Sarah Ellison, I'm Bobby Trossett signing off from this Wednesday live stream. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Same